Many of you have very kindly asked, how was your trip to Israel? I just returned uh, a short while ago and I have answered and tonight included wonderful, complicated and deeply concerning. After too long a hiatus, this was my first trip back to Israel in several years and I needed to fall back in love with her and, and not the Israel of my youth, but the Israel that I could see with more adult and discerning eyes. Where on May 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion stood at a podium at the Tel Aviv Museum and announced the establishment of the State of Israel with a booming recitation of a declaration of independence and where few would have guaranteed that this fledgling state surrounded by hostile armies would survive seven plus decades, much less develop and thrive into modern, diverse, dynamic and innovative society built on such ancient soil. My visit consisted of three very separate weeks. During the first, I attended the CCAR convention, the Central Conference of American Rabbis annual conference, which every seventh year takes place in Israel. It was called Israel at 75, Fostering Relationships, Confronting Complexity. I was among 250 reform rabbis from across North America who gathered in solidarity for deep learning and the pursuit of justice. We toured, we hiked, we laughed, we learned, we heard and studied with some of the most extraordinary scholars and countries, most prominent advocates for pluralism, democracy, and security. It was a paradox like none I have ever experienced. One beautiful afternoon in Jerusalem was spent at Yad Bayad. I don't know if you went to, to Yad Bayad. Hand in hand is how that translates. It's the name of a school in Jerusalem. It's an intentionally mixed Jewish Arab elementary school founded on a commitment to building inclusion and equality between Arab and Jewish citizens of Israel through a remarkable program that is bilingual, integrated and in the hopes of building sustainable bridges between the two communities. Their claim is that in Israel, Jews and Arabs live in separation, fear and violence, and they're on a mission to change that. Starting with only 50 children in 1998, hand in hand, now has six campuses across the country and thousands of Jewish and Arab students. As Israel's fastest growing integrated social movement, their work reaches thousands of people every single day, proving that they can live together as Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians. It was truly remarkable. One not as beautiful morning was spent in a long and hostile line flanked by ultra-Orthodox teenage girls heckling our large and anticipated group of reform rabbis. We waited to pass through security to gain entrance into a very small, very narrow section of the wall of the Kotel designated for women of the wall and where we could pray as a group, a group of women, which is otherwise at the wall forbidden. This particular morning was the start of the Hebrew month of Adar, a time in our tradition that is punctuated by joy. We are meant to rejoice in which we sing and oh how we sung to drown out their taunts. Misha, 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 Nichnas Adar. From the start of the month of Adar, joy should be increased. And we sang and we sang and we sang. And while our group's resolve was strong and our voices united, little else felt joyous. In this narrow and confined space, the morning service was led by courageous and extraordinary Israeli women rabbis, supported by the steadfast women of the wall together with all of us, their allies. And we were quickly surrounded by a mob, truly a mob of ultra-Orthodox girls awaiting us. They had been taken out of school, bussed to the wall specifically to protest our being there yelled, cussed at, spit, they were spitting at us, they were throwing full water bottles at us, they pushed and they kicked. With a hatred I have never in my life witnessed, and which was truly frightening. 
They saw us, many of us middle-aged and older, women praying together, women wearing kippot and talitot, as a dire threat to be stopped at any cost. We were the enemy. They saw girls and women eager to hear words of Torah as heretical and dangerous. This was something I had only read about, something I had only read about in the Talmud, something I could have never imagined. And the very reason cited by the rabbis of the Talmud as the cause of the destruction of both the first and the second temple. It's called Sinat Chinam, baseless hatred. Sinat Chinam, the kind of hatred that destroys literally and figuratively. This same Israel which innovates, motivates, and inspires, that commemorates, honors, and celebrates, was eclipsed that morning by a throng of extremists, while Kota, while the, the wall security and police stood by and watched. And we simply cannot allow that to be. A few very difficult days later, filled with processing and protesting with my colleagues, with more learning, and fortifying our commitment to build a pluralistic, democratic, and just Israel, I was thankful to meet up with an incredibly patient and wonderful group from Temple Sinai, who were all supposed to travel to Israel three years ago in the spring of 2020. We know what happened then. This long-awaited trip was the perfect balm to a tumultuous but vital convention week. Like those who were on that trip, you are students who went on JFI Journey for Identity and are adults. All of you who have participated in our partnership through Federation with Modi'in or who have been to Israel at some point will tell you that nothing compares to that first walk through Machane Yehuda, the open air market with fruits and spices which look and smell and taste only how God could have intended. It elevates, it can't not elevate the heart, the mind, the soul. That first sound of the waves on the beach in Tel Aviv soothes the soul. The sheer magnitude of the ascent to Masada, whether on foot or by cable car, astounds each and every time. Traversing the inside of the Kotel walls, I don't know if you had the opportunity to be inside the Kotel walls, the remnants of the days of the Second Temple destroyed approximately 2,000 years ago, no matter how acrimonious my earlier days outside the wall had been, standing within those narrow spaces and touching the wall, touching a part of Mount Moriah where the binding of Isaac may have taken place, standing in the same place where Jacob may have had that infamous dream, was and is truly unbelievable. Floating effortlessly, although not getting back up so effortlessly in the Dead Sea, the lowest point on earth, I think for many of us is unforgettable. And that palpable feeling of the teaching of the Jewish mystics coming to life in Sfat is exceptional. But by far and away, it is the character of the Israeli people that one encounters at every holy site, every museum, every restaurant, every cab, and every store that is unmistakable. It has served our people not only these last 75 years, but these last 3,500 years. And, or, you are seeing the same news that I am seeing. Rare in my career have I felt the need to sound the alarm. There have been moments of urgency, tremendous urgency about which I have spoken, but tonight I am sounding the alarm. This is a watershed moment for Israel, not one for us to watch at a distance 
and wring our hands, but for one, one for us as Jews and as allies to say we will do something. Israel needs us. The core values of equity, inclusion, respect, and justice upon which Reform Judaism was founded, upon which Temple Sinai itself exists, and upon which Israel has been building itself, are in Israel being toppled one by one. As Rabbi Amiel Hirsch reminds us, after all that, this is the country whose governments, liberal and conservative, left and right, did amazing things, successfully navigating the birth, defense, and development of a tiny, impoverished country surrounded by cutthroat enemies into an economic, cultural, scientific, and military powerhouse within a historical blink of an eye. Israel's GDP is now higher than the European Union's. Zionism, a marginal political movement at the close of the 19th century, became the world's most successful liberation movement of the 20th century. And he goes on to say, Israelis now understand that something fundamental is at stake, and so do we. It is not only the role of the courts and the proper balance of power between the three branches of government. The current debate has long surpassed this one issue. What this struggle is really about is what do we mean when we proclaim Israel to be both Jewish and democratic? What do we mean by democracy? What do we mean by Jewish? And how do we resolve the friction between the two? For understandable reasons, Israel never fully resolved its founding tensions, he writes. She was born three years after the Holocaust. It was a difficult and dangerous birth. Her neighbors were determined to strangle the baby in its crib. Those were desperate times when the future of the remnants of our people was weighed in the balance. In the years after barely winning independence, Israel brought in millions of persecute, persecuted Jews from every corner of the world, most from non-democratic countries, absorbed them with difficulty and unevenly and developed the state piecemeal as best it could, all the while successfully defending itself from daily, daily existential threats. There was not enough time to articulate and legislate fundamental constitutional principles that had broad and popular support. The demands of daily survival, those took precedence. But friends, this is not what we are seeing today. Make no mistake, today the current right-wing extremist government is waging a judicial coup that is not about daily survival. This is only about power. Netanyahu is affirming this by his intention to proceed with the support of his coalition with an entire judicial overhaul. And oh, by the way, that he himself will remain untouchable above the law. In fact, any law which does not suit him can and will likely be revoked. An autocrat. Those who surround Netanyahu are among the most conservative the country has ever seen. The Judaism they espouse is entirely unfamiliar to me, racist, bigoted, and oppressive. One that does not count many of us here in this space as Jews, and certainly does not count Palestinians as valuable members of society. They are working at a breakneck speed on what they are calling judicial reform, undoing decades of progress and what many may fear may bring Israel to the brink of collapse. Perhaps you came for some uplift tonight. And if you know me, you know it is rare for me to stand here and sound so bleak. But however good my time was with my colleagues and with those from our temple trip and with my daughter Jordan, who is studying there for the semester, and each one of those times, each one was truly remarkable and delightful and deeply thoughtful with a couple of noted exceptions. hatred in the eyes of those girls 
were looks that were but a microcosm of unbridled hatred for the other, for me, and that we are seeing in today's majority party in Israel. And those looks on those faces should terrify each and every one of us. Sinat chinam, baseless hatred, hatred that can and will destroy. So what can we do? We can decide not to absent ourselves from the fight for Israel's very health and well-being and survival because it is too complicated, too messy, or too remote. We can acknowledge our own love, our own conflicts, our own ambivalence from a distance and take our cues from the hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people who are protesting each week, every week for these last 11 weeks in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, in Beersheba, and throughout the country, and who are boldly saying, no, no, you cannot overhaul the entire judiciary system, tipping the balance of power in your favor. No, you cannot unilaterally make decisions that we the people do not support. And no, you cannot continue to marginalize, exclude, and criminalize those whose values differ from yours. We can do our part to support a Jewish and democratic state. We can be emboldened by the elite IDF, the Israel Defense Force reservists and pilots who are refusing to show up for duty. We can go to Israel even when, especially when, she needs us the most and we are concerned. We can donate to the Israel Religious Action Center, the Israel Movement for Reform and Progressive Judaism and to Women of the Wall all of whom are at risk of losing $1.5 million of government funding to the current anti-reform movement views of the current government and who fight every single day on the ground in Israel for pluralism, democracy, respect, and safety. We can stay informed by subscribing to any number of publications, including the IRAC, the Israel Religious Action Center's newsletter called The Pluralist, we can attend the rally at 12 Corners on Sunday at 1 p.m. You will see many of us there in support of a pluralistic, democratic, just Israel. Let me say that one more time, one o'clock at 12 Corners in Brighton. And we can engage when Israel needs us most in a more nuanced, complex, and honest way. And we can choose not to let this divide us, but unite us, not in spite of our differences, but because of our differences. And as Anat Hoffman wrote, we can replace doubt with action, replace despair with hope, because that is the Jewish way. And we can say, Amen. Thank <clears throat> you.